Miss Barshana Maharaj's 73rd birthday, as well as the last day of Kartik. Especially, I want to thank our senior devotees, senior members of our community, who's been serving Prabhupada's mission for many, many, many years. So thank you for joining us. We will start uh, we have three more parts of our little gathering today. We will start with the appreciations, then we will have a children's play as their offering. Maharaj really enjoyed <laughs> the little drama last year, so they put something together in a short time. And then uh, Maharaj will give a lecture. So, I would like to ask maybe the senior devotees who would like to offer some words of appreciation of Maharaj, whoever would like to start. I can call some names, but of course, you know, if you're too shy, it's okay. Hare Krishna. So I um, came to New Vrindavan about, I moved here I think about three years ago, a little bit three years ago. And I came first because a Purva was here and I was just passing through on my way out to California. And I felt like I really don't want to go back to California. <laughs> and then I happened to, because it knew when I was on the way, I stopped and came in a temporal and offered basis. And when I looked up, the poor was there and immediately told me he was doing some back to back festivals, cooking for about three weeks. And I, without even thinking, I just, I blurted out, Do you need an assistant? He said, Well, sure. And so I stayed here for about three weeks. And um, during that time, I met Barsha Maharaj for the first time. And, and in the space of our very friendly uh, conversation, he happened to ask me, he said, by the way, where, you know, where, did, where are you from, where did you grow up? And I said, well, I grew up uh, originally in New Jersey. Um, and he said, really? He said, well, what city in New Jersey? I said, it's a small town, I never heard of it, it's like Morristown. I said, Morristown, really? He said, I'm from Chatham. I said, well, Mars, I said Morristown because it's a little bit bigger. He said, I figured you know, but I'm from Chatham. <laughs> he said, really, a township or borough? I said, borough. He said, what street did you live on? I said, Hillside Avenue. He said, I live on Oliver Street. It's like, I don't know, a quarter mile, half mile away. <laughs> He's a few years older than me. So we didn't really know any of the same people. Maybe we had some of the same teachers. But um, that was my very first meeting with Maharaj. And of course, um, I very soon also became endeared to him because of his mood and his, um, his, his wonderful heart of devotion. And you know, with the added element of being here in New Vrindavan for, for so long, and then uh, eventually, and that was one of the catalysts that, that um, where I decided to move to uh, New Vrindavan. Because, you know, the relationships we have with the devotees are really everything. And as, as I get older in years and I go on with my practice of devotional service, I'm realizing more and more that it's so essential in our spiritual development develop these deep, loving relationships with other devotees, especially in the Western world. And growing up, as, as we know, we say that prayer to Shilpani, nervous issues in the body, there's good to do the time. In the general world, and our, in the Western world, and our Western hearts, some of us, myself, especially filled with all these misconceptions and personalism and, uh, and voidness. Uh, in fact, before I came a devotee, I was I was more into Buddhism than anything else. The conception of God as a person 
was very, uh, uh, I, I had big arguments with my brother, who is my Varman production guru, <laughs> about how God could not be a person. And um, anyway, that evolved over time. But um, I realized more and more, especially in the Vrindavan, that this is so essential. Because it's underpinning uh, philosophy or uh, you know, aspect of our whole philosophy given to us by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chintya Veda Veda We are inconceivably simultaneously one with Krishna and at the same time different. How are we to understand that? Well, we can't because it's a chintya. It's inconceivable. And I'm realizing just more and more that these, as we try to attain the goal of our practice, spontaneous devotional service, then um, learning how to associate with devotees and developing these deep, loving relationships are so essential to developing our you know, internal loving mood and, and service to Krishna. So I feel really um, incredibly blessed to be living in New Vrindavan, uh, especially knowing that Varsha Maharaj is here, although I don't see him that often, um, but just knowing he's here and you know, every time I see him, it, it reminds me. And what keeps coming in my mind uh, is Maharaj talked so nicely, so eloquently about how New Vrindavan, how we should understand New Vrindavan. And he says that Prabhupada, because of who he is, he actually called the spiritual world down to this mundane place of existence and created a God. I think of that all the time. And uh, of course, his book is, is so much. I you know, tell people about it all the time. It helps us to enter into that mood where we can actually start seeing these things. Because that was what Prabhupada had envisioned for New Vrindavan and what he envisioned for all of us to realize. And now that's our lifetime task as, as being New Vrindavan Vrindavan is to uh, try to realize that. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Panama, I really like what you said about the loving relationships and the importance of developing them. Varsana Maharaj is such an embodiment of so personal and loving and deep relationships. I'm going to call up my good husband. What should I? I'm a senior devotee like a giant redwood tree is a senior tree just because you've been around a long time as you want to advance. Um, Mars was the first devotee who, who asked me, he, he asked that I serve in the, under him in, in the department that he was working when I first came. Follow the department. Mary Fonda and Azari, you can see him smiling already, just hearing it. All the cars. Working with the, cow, with, with the horses to feed the cows, plowing up all the fields, disking, harrowing, planting, harvesting, spreading manure. I uh, was probably the first one to get fired from that department also. <laughs> But uh, my marsh from you, you know, I learned proper, I hesitate to use the word work ethic because we didn't just go to even on work, you know, we, we lovingly engage in the service of Prabhupada. But he, you taught me by your personal example how important that is, that we just use all of our energy, whatever resources we've been given by the grace of God, to serve the spiritual master and his mission. And uh, by your personal example, it's been deeply ingrained in my heart. And uh, I'm just eternally indebted to you for that. And uh, I remember when we, we lived together in the attic of the old temple in Bahuaban. And the uh, ceiling height was about you know, three and a half feet, something like that. 
He couldn't walk. He had to you know, squat and crawl on your knees or just scoot. But you definitely couldn't stand up. And uh, a few things up from up there. I used to count just the seconds in my mind, and just when he laid down, how long it would take him to fall asleep. And it rarely exceeded, if ever, I don't think it exceeded 40 seconds. His head would hit the pillow and practically instantaneously he would be killed by a person breathing. The person was asleep. And it just, he, he, he utilized all of his energy during the day to just serve Shiva Prabhupada and try to implement and realize Prabhupada's mission here for New Vrindavan. And he gave us all in that capacity. And visiting devotees would come, and they want. Newford Dowden was famous for the work ethic of the residents. Prabhupada Paul was back as early as 1969, maybe even 68. He referred to the residents of Newford Dowden as inmates, just like you have inmates in the prison, you can't escape. So I'm sure many of you have the experience that Vrindavan Chandra just grab your heart and he will not let you go. And Maharaj, you also exemplify that, that you are just captive here. You just, not even, it's not that you can't go, you don't even want to go anymore. So, uh, another thing in the attic of, of the temple building when we were living up there, there was a period of time when I had great difficulty getting up in the morning. And you would get up in two thirty, quarter to three, something like that. And, uh, it wasn't that I was just, you know, wanted to stay in bed and sleep. But it was just like when I would, when I would wake up, I would immediately think, "Oh, Krishna, I've got so much to do today. I can't possibly get it done." And instead of going to chant Jopra, he would just spend some time and just, you know, encouraging me to get up and get started. And I did, and it kept me in that groove. <laughs> um, and I, I've always you know, encouraged people who want to meet you and want to get to know you to do that. Uh, when my wife and I, when we were living in Minneapolis, before we moved back here, or well, me back, her for the first time, I was hoping that she would um, develop a relationship with you, you know, just to get to know you and serve you. And, I think she's done that quite well, <laughs> and I'm grateful for that. I, I know that you've personally helped me a tremendous amount, and uh, helped so many others, as we can see just from the few, these, those that are in this room now, and many more who are not. Um, one of the things that in my, well, a couple of things in my mind that you really personify is the, um, the intention and mission and mood of Srila Prabhupada for New Vrindavan. And, uh, you know, Srila Prabhupada, his intention for New Vrindavan is, well, it's, it, it's different from what we see today. He, Prabhupada wanted that we live by by the grace of God, and the, from the bounty of, of nature, that we, we grow all of our own food, we produce even our clothing from, from the land, we utilize you know, the animals to, to help assist us in this way, we utilize our life energy in, in trying to be self-reliant and dependent upon the, the mercy of, of the Lord, and dependent upon the cows actually also. And you've never let this spirit die, um, even when times when it's not so obvious that Prabhupada wants like this. You, by, by your actions, by your words, by your deeds, you, you've done as best you can to keep that alive. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. It is so important. That, that we understand you know, the purpose of New Vrindavan community, why Srila Prabhupada established this community. Because Prabhupada taught us that the materialistic society can collapse at any time because it's based on falsity, on, 
uh, just untruth. And it's just because it's a materialistic um, lifestyle, it, it can't survive. And it should probably foresee the collapse of, of Western society. And he wanted that New Vrindavan and other communities like New Vrindavan become a beacon to, to attract people, to show how anybody can be happy by living on the bounty of, of, of nature and the grace of the Lord and the spiritual master, by growing our own food, protecting the cow, like that. Sri Prabhupada wrote in, in one very early letter to, to High River Guru, when High River was, was temple president here, 1968. He, he, Sri Prabhupada um, stated his, his vision for New Vrindavan. It should be an ideal community with ideal Krishna conscious men, it should be ideal ashram. He said, ideal ashram again. And then in, in closing, he said, I don't know if these ideals can be given practical shape, but I think like this. That any man, meaning woman also, can be happy by living simply, producing our own food, taking care of the cows, and having Krishna in the center of our lives. And Maharaj, you have, have tried your best to see to it that Prabhupada's vision was actually, actually implemented and, and realized here, and I'm just extremely indebted to you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So next in line, stop up on Chicago. Hi, Krishna. I wanted to mention that when I arose today and began my work day, I walked out to the tractor and I left the key. So the tractor was going to start. So I went and I got the jump box, the box that you use, the portable the electric the battery to start the other battery. And it was dead. And then I went to get the after battery charger, it does work on electric. It was a whole ordeal running extension cords a couple hundred feet. And as I went to hook it up, the alligator clip broke. Off. And I knew that I, I was intending to come here to say something wonderful about you. So, um, what, it, what those series of events did was reminded me of how many hundreds of times I was with you over the years in which we were in exactly those kind of situations. <laughs> Under very uh, austere conditions, sometimes not always the right equipment. The right. So I am so grateful to you that you, through all that adversity, I, as your um, hopefully assistant, was taught many lessons, actually. Some of which weren't immediately apparent. But later, on, upon reflection, I thought about well, him. Yeah. Here's a person who doesn't complain and at the same time puts himself in very difficult circumstances in order to accomplish something that is very great, which is the fulfillment of Shiva Prabhupada's desire for New Vrindavan. So as I reflect back on those periods of time, the first that comes to me is the very first day I came here, 1974, June, and I was coming down the road with a, a friend of mine in a Volkswagen bus, which was standard transportation. Bus. The 1970s. <laughs> and as we came down the road, kind of looking at the scenery, left, right, the hills and you know, old farmhouses, a barn here and there. And something caught my vision on the right. And on the right hand side of the road, I saw you all by yourself in a field 
questions about where uh, for those of you who don't know the layout of the room, they were on the right hand side before you got to the and single handedly you were loading a hay wagon with a team of horses. And I immediately thought that's that's the person I want to work with. <laughs> so I did. I got out and devoted. I went through an episode where all my the hand tools that I had were, were all scattered out. So I thought, well, this is what it means to surrender. So I went and found you. And in those uh, formative years of New Down, very early New Down, it was a very magical time because the, um, it's like a village of young people. There was, there was no such thing as an old person. In there. Everybody was in their 20s or so. 29. 29 was the oldest person. <laughs> and we weren't all that expert at playing living high thinking. So because of that, everybody had to have not just a it was a leader, of course. But everybody, you had to have many shiksha leaders as well. And I know for me, during that, that uh, very trying period, very austere period, you set an example that I am very um, indebted to you for. For example, um, I had the distinct pleasure of working with you on with the horses and the mules and with the draft animals for some time. Not all the time, but a good bit of the time. And the work was so challenging, it was so physically demanding that it was a basically rise early, bathe, whatever temperature of water was there, attend Mangalartik, Dress the deities. This is in the Ulaman. Not, not just the Brahmacharya Ashram, but in the Ulaman. And the reason we had decided to stay in the Ulaman was because the time it took to walk up there at night, because our day would never finish until it was dark. And then we would, especially on a moonless night, it was really spooky and dark, <laughs> walking two miles up the old and down. So we would stay in the Wulan and we would sleep in the attic. Of course, Shaka, you were mentioning the attic. The attic in the old Wulan temple, the old Caulfield farmhouse, which was a Civil War era uh, building, amazing building. But it was a, basically a crawl space. You could just kind of had a hunch to find your place, but we had put a floor in. And I would sleep at one end of it and you would sleep at the opposite end. Of it. A few other devotees, Brahmacharya scattered around here and there. And I remember waking up like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night because the noise of fighting rats was, was so disturbing. <laughs> so you'd lay there for a minute going, well, this is interesting, you know. <laughs> I'm not only living with Brahmacharyas up here, but there's other living entities as well. <laughs> and I would. I would peer down to the end, the other end of the building, of the, of the attic rather, where you were, and you were very peacefully reading Chaitanya Charitamrita at midnight. And I was thinking, this is like supernatural. He doesn't sleep. And then the next day, you, know, you would think, well, his performance would be compromised because he's not sleeping and it's going to be going to reflect in his service, but it didn't, it never did. It's like you were, and once in a while, I'd catch you sleeping on the bulldozer, but. <laughs> in the <laughs> But, but uh, it, was, it was such a stirring example of um, not just tapasya, but maha tapasya that you were performing that I felt uh, completely in good hands. Like this is the person who not only understands the import of what we're trying to do here, build who we're down, but they have a philosophical grip on why they're doing this. 
that is contagious. It, it makes other people inspired also to help. So um, in that time frame, the leader of the community at the time, Kirtan Anandaswamy, in, in observing our camaraderie, he said, I am absolutely certain that in my previous life, the two of you were an ox team. <laughs> so I took that, well, that's a compliment. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm on your appearance day, I want to thank you for being such a wonderful example for me. And for, um, when you're in the spiritual world, and I'm still here trying to charge batteries and do some farming. Please uh, pray for me. I'll come and assist you in the next lifetime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prince Prabhu. And now our next speaker is Sankirtan Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So my humble obeisances. I've only really known Maharaj from a distance. I've uh, admired him from a distance. Um, when he, he moved up to his present uh, situation, we, uh, both my wife and I, we felt honored to have Maharaj as a uh, neighbor. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Ruchi's not feeling so well and she wanted to come but uh, couldn't make it. But as the devotees were saying, down in, uh, in Bahulavan, there was a, you know, strong worth, uh, work ethnic. And so uh, very often, uh, devotees really didn't have the time to study too much. Everybody was busy in, in work. It reminds me actually of, of a vision that the founding fathers had uh, when the United States started, that they wanted farmers but they also wanted those farmers to be well educated and well read. So uh, I've always seen Maharaj working very hard on the tractors, with the animals, doing so many things all day long, totally fully engaged. And I uh, was surprised and delighted. I don't know when that point was. Uh, but all of a sudden I realized that Maharaj was a great Vaishnava scholar and he was very proficient in Chaitanya Leela. <clears throat> and so uh, here in Nuvindavan, uh, we don't have, uh, well, we have a few scholars, I guess Gorshakti is a, a scholarly type of person. But uh, anyways, um, <clears throat> New Vrindavan has always had a strong work, work ethnic. And I think this vision of the founding fathers that to be engaged in some work, not, not just any work, but the founding fathers were especially uh, um, appreciative of those, devoted, of those people that were involved in small farming enterprises. The small farmers and the small businessmen, and uh, they wanted everybody to be a reader and well read. They felt that being well informed was the only way that uh, America was going to survive. In a sense, I think we, we can take a valuable lesson from that. Because it's, it's not just the hard work, but also uh, being, uh, having a firm foundation uh, and a firm understanding in the Krishna consciousness philosophy. And so that's very, very much what I appreciated Maharaj. He was both a hard worker as a great example and an example as also as a, a brilliant scholar of the Vaishnava tradition and the Chaitanya philosophy. And I just am um, so thankful, I'm so very thankful, Maharaj, that you've continued to make New Vrindavan your home. And I feel uh, very privileged to have your brief association at times over the years. So thank you. Thank you, Sankirtan Prabhu. And it's time for our, our dear Sachin. 
Sachin Martas. Ah, eu Sachin Martas. Uh, um, I was just going to read my offering, but since everyone's telling stories, I thought I would tell a couple of stories of how we first met Varshana Maharaj, my husband and myself. Um, I believe it was 1979. Um, we came up here, I think it was autumn, but it was cold. And um, we were just visiting New Vrindavan. We were living about uh, three hours south of here, near Charleston, West Virginia at that time. And uh, a snowstorm hit. And we were staying in a cabin of, I think her name was Veda Mata. Uh, she had a, a lady that had a cabin here. She wasn't living here at that time. Um, but she had a really nice cabin. It was like deluxe in those days um, at the Bulaban. So anyway, that's where we were staying. And then the, the snowstorm hit. And we couldn't get out. With it, you know, I don't even know if we had four wheel drive then, probably not. But anyway, we were waiting for Maharaj, who was Kashapa Das at that time, to come and plow uh, the road so we could get out. And he didn't, he didn't come for maybe two days because <laughs> he was busy, so we had no choice but to stay here, you know, at New Vrindavan. And my husband and I said, that's it. We'll never move there. Because we were considering it and we were like, no, no way. It's too crazy. It's too remote. It's too this. It's too that. So anyway, almost 43 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> My husband's not, but I am. Um, anyway, then the, of course, when we did move here, you know, we, we got to meet him and, and everything. But uh, another story is we wanted, oh, and, and when we did buy the land, and he was the one in charge of making the road, and there was no road where we lived in Taliban. It was, uh, I, I, I couldn't even believe my husband bought the property, but um, we did, so. I was really mad because I, I wouldn't have gotten that property, but I mean, I'm glad we got it now. But anyway, um, Varshana Marsh was supposed to make a, 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 a road, a, a driveway, and, um, it was really rough. It was really rough, and it took a long time because you had to plow through the forest because there was no road there. So anyway, um, that first winter was really, really hard because it got done so late. We didn't get in there till October, I think, and so we had no way of heat, and we had to use one of those propane heaters, which threw me into the hospital um, with my asthma because I didn't know I was allergic to propane. So I wound up spending a couple months back in Philadelphia with my mother because I couldn't handle it. It's amazing, we're still here in New Vrindavan. But um, then the third story is um, we wanted to build a house. And so uh, Mara started the digging process and then my husband and I went to India for a couple months. And when we came back, the land had slid down and the hole that was supposed to be ready for the footers and the foundation was all full of water. I mean, it was like a lake. And so when Maharaj came to check it out, he said, we had a swimming pool, an above ground swimming pool. He goes, the swimming pool's got to go. And he said, the house is going to go over there. <laughs> so that's where it went. <laughs> so anyway, he, he worked it. We were probably at our place for that whole summer, I think, um, the Manga Manjuri, working on the bulldozer and setting the place up for to build our house and I think we got it done in 1998 or 99 something like that but anyway I'm glad I'm still here and I'm glad Maharaj is still here we're very very fortunate dear Varshan Maharaj please accept my humble obeisances all glories to Srila Prabhupada and to you on your appearance day although you exhibit all the 26 qualities of a devotee I would like to concentrate on just a few. The first quality is kind to everyone. You are always so kind and grateful for whatever little service is rendered to you or to your mission. I love to cook for you because you're always so happy to receive it with no complaints ever. And you're always so grateful. Not like some people cook for it. <laughs> Number two, uh, does not quarrel with anyone. 
Instead of quarreling, you just humbly accept what happens. It comes your way. Grin and bear it. Number three, fixed in the absolute truth. Um, this quality is just revealed over and over whenever I hear you speak. Just when I thought I heard the best and deepest lecture ever, you give a talk like the one on this year's Radostomy, and I'm just blown away by your realizations and how you can bring the audience right into that transcendental reality that you're sharing. I'll skip around. Um, I like how you exhibit the quality of simplicity. You are not like the other Iskand sannyasis and gurus because you keep it simple. You keep it humble, and instead of having a servant, you are the servant. The next two qualities go together, peaceful and completely attached to Krishna. You're always equiposed no matter what the current politics are in Vrindavan. Whether the issues involve you or not, you remain peaceful, unattached, and completely attached to Krishna and Srimati Radharani because you have total understanding of what the reality really is and you have faith that Krishna is in control. The next two qualities totally describe Maharaj. No material desires and steadiness. Everything you do, everything you plan, and everything in your life is spiritual. All you desire is to serve Srila Prabhupada and fulfill his desires for New Vrindavan. And in this effort, you are the most steady. You put your all in all in his divine mission every single day, thereby making you the steadiest. And I like these three qualities, merciful, friendly and poetic. You are so merciful, giving your association to all without holding back. You're always friendly to everyone and especially to young new seekers that come by and poetic. Many of your descriptions about Radharani and Krishna, Lord Mahaprabhu and his associates are so poetic. It feels as if you are singing their divine glories. So the last two qualities as spoken by Srila Prabhupada are he is expert and he is silent. Yes, Maharaj, you are expert in enlivening us year after year, decade after decade, helping us to see into and realize the most intimate pastimes of the Lord. You're steady in your mission to serve Srila Prabhupada. And in all of this, you are silent to the outward temporary distractions and instead stay focused on your service. Thank you, Varshana Maharaj, for being our guiding light here at Uvrindav and Dham. I don't think I would have as much determination to have stayed here year after year without your inspiration. May I always remain in your service. Thank you so, so much. Thanks for coming, Mother Kamala. Hi, Krishna. Um, thank you very much for always being my brother and you calling me sis, your sister. And that really is very important to me that we have that connection. And anytime I've had difficulties, like a good wife, I, you know, complaining about my husband, I would go to you and <laughs> You were so kind. First, you would always tell me, thank you for reminding me why you're a sannyasi. <laughs> and then, I would, you would allow me to vent. And then, I always knew that there were three important things that I can always trust about you. And one is that you never, ever judge and that you're always confidential. I would never tell anything that I say to you. And the third is then you would give me some very good advice. And one of the most important things you would tell me is now you have to, now that you've vented, you have to think of 10 things about your husband you're grateful for. <laughs> and I would say, well, I can't think of any. <laughs> So you would, you would prompt me and say, well, he brushes his teeth, right? <laughs> and yeah, and then, you know, you somehow figure out different ways that for me to be grateful. And uh, so I so much appreciate your, um, then you would, just to make me feel 
okay about my venting, you would vent a little too. <laughs> and I always knew that you were there as my friend. And um, I love your classes. They're very important and valuable contribution to give us a deeper understanding. And um, it's just so amazing for me to always hear your classes. And I thank you very much. I got so immersed hearing you that I don't know who is the next one. <laughs> I think I'm going to call up on some disciples. Do you have a long one or a short one? Long one. Long one. <laughs> Go become what you like to say if you like. So thank you for putting me on spot, Matajin. <laughs> Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my obeisances. Um, I feel very unqualified to even appreciate you. And I, I have no words to express my appreciation, really. When I hear all these stories, I wish I was there during these times. I guess it's unfortunate I was born a little late. <laughs> The first time I met you was during my birthday. I was just expressing how much happy I was when I first met you. I was expressing that to Mother Madhuri yesterday. I've never seen anyone like you, and you are the first sannyasi that I've ever been able to express or have any kind of conversation. Usually my um, approach or any, sannyasi that any sannyasis I've seen is like from far away. Uh, I would get really happy just by seeing them. But you're the first one I've ever, I was ever able to talk to or ask questions and to communicate with. I just feel thankful for get, getting this opportunity to have you here in Yorindam. And you were kindly answering all my stupid questions. <laughs> and thank you, Marsh. Thank you for being here for us. I appreciate it. If I could only learn to serve you, you never ask, but are always there to inspire. Never interfering with free will, waiting for me to realize your desire. Your desire is to serve your Gurudev. Bless me so one day I can serve mine, Srila Gurudev. Holding my hand on this difficult path, clearing the woods to reveal the view, to you it was always there. I was just lost somewhere. You ask for help, yet I am the one being helped. It seems you are thirsty, yet I am the one going to the well. You narrate a pastime, deep within myself I delve. You share your realizations like I'm a friend. These mystic meetings are mystical. I pray they will never end. Your words are a meditation. Your silence is samadhi. Your smile a confirmation. You exhibit that we are not the body. Your standards are high. Tolerance is higher. You water my roots that are ever so drier. Your walk, your walk is gentle. Your words are brave. You are the confidential wealth of New Vrindavan. I have not met anyone more brave. Your color is saffron with a touch of golden, like autumn reflecting in Radha Kun, with Radharani's love that is molten. You honor Mother Earth and respect her bounties. You are not collecting things you need, just saving us from our greed. Obstacles are the ornaments that enhance your character. Steady in your duty while working with horses or driving a tractor. Let me sit at your lotus feet so I can collect Chintamani. I'm just a poor man with a lot of money. Your servant, Rabu Charitas.
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisance. Dear Sarshan Swami Maharaj, only by the paths you clear can the Dham's petals unfolding be fully appreciated and held sacred in a grateful heart's holding. Only by your revelation can we begin to understand the extent of our great fortune at being planted in this land. Only by your satisfaction is our service a success, learning by fulfilling what you say is best. Only by your words so wise and Krishna's pastimes so vividly told do we become awestruck and dumbfounded at the priceless nature of your heart of gold. Only by your presence do we feel purified anew, as though we've bathed in all of the holy rivers and visited the sacred tirthas too. Only by your association does this restless mind become quiet and calm, giving space and time to focus on the holy name and the scripture's soothing balm. Only by your example can we truly understand what it means to serve Guru and Krishna with our hearts, minds, and hands. Only by your acceptance do I find the will to chant and carry on in spite of my cheating and rascaline behavior and feeling like a con. Only by your heart's bright fire can I come to the realization of how dirty are the waters in my heart and how to receive purification. Only by your tolerance have I finally learned to see how my folly and rebellious nature are detrimental to building sincerity. Only by your patience do these anartos pass away, slowly grinding into this heart of stone with the transcendental words you say. Only by your forgiveness do I find any hope at all of becoming a worthy servant despite of how I fall. Only by your encouragement can I pick myself back up, letting go of guilt and shame and the habits that keep me stuck. Only by your blessing is there any chance for me to gain determination and enthusiasm for becoming a devotee. After receiving the great blessing of your appearance before me, my heart becomes saturated with a dense, expansive, and deep-seated love. A love that must be born out of your own immovable love for Guru and Krishna. This warm flame of the heart is filled with reassurance, acceptance, and so much gratitude. Please, I beg you to forgive me of any offensive behavior I have committed. I am eternally grateful for your tolerance of my nonsense and for continually allowing me to reside in this holy place and to offer you some semblance of service. I so very much want to serve you in the best way possible, no matter what I do. I will never feel that it is enough to express my growing gratitude and appreciation for you. Krishna has been too kind in leading me to such a stalwart and committed devotee. Your blessing and acceptance are the only means by which I can learn the qualities of steadfastness, loyalty, persistence, and reliability. How can I do anything properly in love and devotion without all of these graces coming from the ocean of your soul. Being as I am helplessly dependent upon your mercy, please, you must continue glancing mercifully upon me and giving me the shelter of your lotus feet, as there is no other way or place that I can turn. In the name of service and your mercy and love for Krishna, on your, on your, give me more. You I'm not a good writer, I'm not a good speaker. I mean, uh, my God siblings have done such an amazing job. Um, all I can say is thank you very much for accepting me. 
every time I go through a tough time in my life, I turn to you and you always guide me. Um, you always find time and you always ground me. Um, I am so fortunate to have a father who cares so much regardless of how much physically pain you might be in, you never let anyone realize how much you're going through. You're always trying to serve. Our phone calls always end with how you, you ask me how I can serve you. <laughs> I want to serve you very much. I'm so fortunate every time I'm on the altar serving the deities. Can't thank you enough for taking me under your shelter and giving me the opportunity to serve. Every time I'm Coming to the home here feels like I'm coming home. All the love you have showered on all of us. We are so, so very indebted. I'm always praying to Krishna, to Lord Krishna Dev, to please take care of you and forgive us for our <coughs> faults and mistakes that we continuously do. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for accepting. ago, we were in this cabin, and Maharaj, we had a kids camp, and Maharaj was digging the ghat, and we were watching, I don't know if this cabin or that cabin, we were watching him on the heavy equipment, and like Bonnie, her children were like this little, I was like two, but Maharaj has been excavating Vrindavan in New Vrindavan for many years. And it's, he's the, he's the silent one. He's always in the background, but always, once he opens his mouth and starts talking, just enlivens you, you just become Krishna conscious. We used to meet in different places I don't know, Tuesday evening or something, and Maharaj used to talk all about Lord Chaitanya. It was always Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. And it was so wonderful. Maharaj is in, he's not that flamboyant person. He's the humble person, truly humble. And you feel embarrassed by your own lack of humility when you're around my rush. I mean, I, I don't know, I haven't written anything, I just... Thank you, Maharaj, for your so many years of keeping so many of us Krishna conscious by your own service to Srila Prabhupada with your determination to carry out his instructions. So many people couldn't see what you were doing up on the hill, building a temple you know, on the hill. And then finally, 
And they understood that it was Prabhupada's desire and his instructions, not just something Maharaj wanted to do. So, although you're always in the background, you're like a foundation. You, you keep things solid here in your Vrindavan on a very wonderful level. And I'm so glad Krishna made it. I don't want to say made it so you're sick and can't travel all over the world. But I'm glad that the arrangement was made by Krishna that you are always here in New Vrindavan. Because when you have those deep spiritual questions and doubts or difficulties, ah, oh, I better go talk to Maharaj. And it's, it's our good fortune. So thank you so much for your service, Maharaj, and your kindness. All glories to Prabhupada, all glories to Parshana Swami. Thank you, Mother Jashi. That was a really, really sweet ending. I apologize for those who are not able to share their offerings. Mm. I just want to say to add to Mother Jashi's offering that yes, we are very grateful that you love the New Vrindavan done so much that I remember that your heart, as you told me, your heart is here. So when you go away, you will tell me how I can live without my heart. My heart is here. I need to come back because my heart is here. I cannot stay and exist and function anywhere else without my heart. So you lost your heart in New Vrindavan and we are grateful for it. I'm not sure, it doesn't look like the children are ready, so what we are going to do, we are going to have Maharaj to give us your deep and profound lecture. is very dear to the devotees as <clears throat> they are very dear to her. It's Shrimati Radharani's month when her grace prevails. Also, it's the month that we I think our Urja Vrat. Urja comes from the name Urjeshwari, which is Radha, who is the source of spiritual power. And her month is so invigorating for progressing or <clears throat> coming back to standards where we have been deficient.
this is the time when these two months meet. Kartika is the month when Krishna returned to Vrindavan from Mathura. And he leaves in the middle of Rasa Lila tonight, which is the time when Lord Chaitanya arrives in Vrindavan. It's the month where so many very special events <clears throat> and transitions occur which leave an indelible mark on the tapestry of creation, <clears throat> depicting the love of God and our hopes of attaining a role in his love. <clears throat> Lord Chaitanya, who arrives just as Kartik ends and Maharishi begins, is the most magnanimous of all avatars because he, dis <coughs> he descended to bestow that most rare and unique flavor of love of Vrindavan. <coughs> A mood of devotion to himself, as was never given before. <clears throat> and his love is known through the lives of his devotees and associates, which are so sweet with the essence of Ras, that as we relish the lives of his devotees, <clears throat> we, come, we become attracted by their compassion and develop affection without artifice for their feet, meaning rendering devotion service. <clears throat> the grace of Krishna follows in the footsteps of his devotees. <clears throat> and the Lord considers the worship of his devotees higher than praise of himself. <clears throat> And we see it practically that Krishna refuses to accept the worship of anyone who disregards service to his devotees. Because he can taste the undesirable flavor of pride in such an approach. <coughs> the only path to pleasing the Lord is found in following the footsteps of his devotees, that is the verdict of all Shastras, which directs our bhakti. <clears throat> the one who has attained second initiation and thereby obliged to serve the deity. Those offerings necessitate the emblem of Krishna's most beloved. Tulsi Devi, who appears today after hundred years, hundred celestial years of pregnancy, during which Madhavi was becoming more and more effulgent. while the child within her womb is waiting for Kartik Purnim to appear in this world. And that indicates how so many <clears throat> developments throughout this most blessed month find their culmination today. Lord Krishna <clears throat> incarnates for the purpose of accepting our service of worship in a form called Arch Avatar. <clears throat> that means the Lord who grace, graciously accepts our offering. 
And that word, Archavatar, <coughs> is often predicated by the term <coughs> Varksha, combination being Varksha Archavatar. Varksha comes from the root Vriksha, tree. In this case, specifically, a desired tree whose leaves and flowers are the essence of the famous Patam Prishtam Galam Dvayam Yome Bhakti Priyatsati, which can be interpreted that Krishna likes offerings that precede the sustenance have been cultivated by the loving hands of his own devotees. That verse is also interpreted by Shri Vishwara Chakravarta, where it's meaning Tulsi. Whose <clears throat> leaves, flowers, utilized in the worship of Krishna, produce the fruit of love of God. earlier this week, we gathered here <coughs> to celebrate the anniversary, not anniversary, what do you call it? Engagement. Mother Shalala and Dr. Samuel. Shalala is a word which means the inexplicable complexion of Krishna which is like a blend of a sapphire with an inexplicable internal golden luster in a dark monsoon rain cloud and the infinite blue sky. And Samuel is Hebrew for the name of God. <clears throat> During that time, we discussed the very first institution established by Krishna. An institute means an organization created for the promotion of some field of activity or religion or culture or education. And we discussed on that occasion Genesis. The prophet will often quote the Bible. In Genesis, we find the archetypal first man. After the Lord created the firmament, the heavens, the sky, the earth, the oceans, the animals, the vegetation, the birds, after every step in creation, he blessed. It is good. It was only when he created man that he found that this is not good. It doesn't mean that men aren't good. It meant that the Lord found that for man to be alone was not good. He needed a helper. At this time, in Genesis, <coughs> Adam is performing the task on behalf of the Lord of naming all the animals. And in that culture, more so in Gaudiya Vaishnava culture, giving a name is a task of great importance because it creates and conveys an identity. And it, in devotional cultures, the name was chosen to indicate the essence of the person or item. And in biblical culture, 
the name of God was considered too sacred to be spoken or written. <clears throat> and a name was considered so special that any person undergoing a major spiritual transition or revelation was given an appropriate name to mark the occasion, as we find very prominently in Shaitanya Leela in the case of Shamananda Pandit, whose former name was Duki Krishnadas. But because he brought pleasure to Radha, she renamed him Shamananda. <clears throat> and in Shaitanya Leela we find <clears throat> Nilambar Chakravarti, who's the same Garga Muni from Krishna Lila, attending the birth ceremony of Lord Gauranga, and seeing the emblems on the baby Lord's lotus feet, the flag, thunderbolt, goad, and fish, understood. This is the Lord. And he gave him the name Vishwambar, which means he, will, he is able to maintain and protect the entire world. Furthermore, with his, with his birth, the drought in Bengal that threatened the residents with famine ended with long and gentle rainfall. Hence the name Vishwambar. There was a mystery Brahman in that assembly who spoke very gravely and convincingly, this child is none other than Narayan. Hence, I support the name Vishwambar. And the ladies feeling for the loss of Mother Sachi, whose eight daughters died just after birth. Those eight daughters being the coverings, earth, water, fire, air, ether, which have to be dispelled from our hearts before the Lord appears. Feeling for Mother Sachi, the ladies named the Lord Nimai, thinking that that name, like the Neem tree, being antiseptic would remind the Yamaraj of how much pain he had created and he would spare this son. Plus he was born under a neem tree. Hence the name Nimai. <clears throat> and when Mother Sachi was nursing her baby Nimai, she saw on the soles of his feet the same flag, lightning bolt, goad, and fish. And she was so filled with ecstasy, her tear, tears were flowing from her eyes and her hair standing on end. And she offered obeisances to those tiny feet of her baby and proclaimed to her husband, Jagannath Misha, that now we are delivered. There will be no more births in this world because the Lord has appeared in our home. And then when he grew a little older, and just like little Krishna, Jagannath Misha would ask, bring my sandals. And baby Gopal, taking his father's sandals upon his head, delivering them to his lotus feet, delighted in being the servant of his servants. Similarly, Jagannath Misha called me my, bring me my book. And Nimai scampered off, and both Mishra and Mother Sachi heard the sweet sound of ankle bells jingling to the rhythm of his graceful movements. They thought, that's strange, he's not wearing ankle bells. And when they looked on the floor, they saw that there was footprints marking where he had just been and those footprints bore the same emblems of the flag, thunderbolt, elephant, goat, and fish. And again, they offered no obeisances to those footprints and concluded that this is the Leela 
of our Dhammadar Shila, who is, who is vicariously experiencing his baby and childhood Leela through our son, Nimai. So Misha told him about the subject. He must be hungry for Dhammadar Shila. Make him a special offer, and I will offer Anshagelia. <clears throat> So back to Genesis, when Adam, I mean Abel, yeah, Adam, was naming all the species based on their essence. And then he began wondering, what is my essence? And he couldn't answer that himself. He couldn't come up with a name for himself to correlate with his essence. So the Lord, who said that every previous creation was good, and this one wasn't, he created from man's essence woman and named her Eve, who is in many ways man's deepest self. And how can we say such a thing? Because <clears throat> females <clears throat> feel free to speak about their identities and their identity crisis, where, which is rare amongst men who seem to have a code of silence about deeper issues of the heart, which can lead to loneliness and insecurity if the fear of self-expression dominates the family relationships. And we see, practically speaking, that men need to talk to their other half and their children and tell the story of their life. <clears throat> and children need to tell their stories. They need to be adults. <clears throat> and the exchange provides a foundation of love and trust that can last a lifetime. And what I would like to emphasize today in regards to the birth of Tulsi Maharani, is that females are also especially gifted in helping men develop an awareness of their link with nature <clears throat> and the signals and the intuition the body sends to which females are more attuned and men more likely to hide and ignore. <clears throat> In the abode of Lord Garanga, Navadri Dam, all the eight islands and the stamen Nine islands, eight, which are the petals of the lotus, ninth is the stamen. They all have appropriate names relating to the aspect of the devotional service that each of those islands supports. <clears throat> when Lord Nityananda was taking Jiva Goswami on Parikrama of Navadvip, and they reached the central stamen, Antardvip, Jiva Goswami House. Why that name? <clears throat> because Antar means heart, secret, confidential, the essence. <clears throat> and that's where Lord Garanga appeared way before his birth. to show mercy to Lord Brahma 
who was so distraught about what he had done to Krishna in stealing the cows and coward boys. And the island is named Antardweep because that's where the Lord revealed his heart, that he couldn't understand himself. He had to take the emotions, the mood, the identity of Srimati Radharani even to understand himself. <clears throat> and that's where the seed was sown for the appearance of Srila Haridas Thakur to spread the holy name, distributing the essence of life's purpose and goal to all the world through those following him in the Prana Gaudiya Sampradaya. <clears throat> we become dear to Krishna by endearing our hearts to Krishna's beloveds. It is not that devotion to Krishna is the goal of life as too often mistakenly thought. The spirit of Das Das Amudas Jesus the word, culminating in service to Srimati Radharani and her potencies, beginning and represented by those devotees in our midst here on earth today, who are all manifestations of her power to please Krishna. And that's what we see in Damodar Lila. Srila Prabhupada says that Krishna wants to be chastised sometimes. He wants to be controlled. But how is that possible? It's only possible for someone to control Krishna if they have more love for him than he has for them. Hence, Mother Jashoda, who is a mental figure in Vatsalya Bhav, reflecting the pastime where Srimati Radharani bound Lord Krishna with a tender flowering creeper. She tied him to a tree because she was late for an appointment. <clears throat> And with the birth of Tulsi Devi today to her parents, <clears throat> Madhavi Devi and Dharmadvaj, they too saw the emblem on her lotus feet, which was the lotus, which was her essence, good fortune. by approaching western shores mid-Atlantic cried out, oh brothers, even before reaching America, calling out, oh brothers, I emphatically declare unto you, you will receive your good fortune from the Supreme Lord Krishna, only when Srimati Radharani becomes pleased with you. So seeing the mark, the emblem of the lotus, on the soles of the baby's feet, they named her Tulsi. Because that's, she, it means incomparable. And from her very birth, she was so determined to stay and pray in the forest until Krishna agreed to become her husband, that nobody could dissuade or stop her. The same day she was born, she, evaded 
and overpowered all her family members who were trying to keep her home. Her resolve was unstoppable, and all the challenges in her life simply made her stronger. The beginning of the Leela was her being cursed by Srimati Radharani. It's not like the curses of this world. That was a blessing for this world, encrypted within the curse. Vrinda was cursed by Srimati Radharani to take birth on earth. Otherwise, we would not have the nurturing influence of Tulsi Maharani in our devotional lives. She was cursed by Radha, married to a apparent demon, Shankara, cheated by Lord Vishnu himself, mistreated by Saraswati, deeply hurt by Lakshmi Devi who cursed her again to become a tree. And what is significant about a tree in symbolism? A tree is an emblem of resilience due to its deep rootedness, which gives it forbearance and tolerance, benevolence, drawing up the energy of the earth, distributing through its fruits and flowers. <clears throat> and Tulsi is the first name on the list of those who are Tadiya, the dear to Krishna. and whose emblem further unites the foreheads of Vaishnavas. When Srila Prabhupada came to America, he said he was very unhappy because there was no Tulsi here. And he was so delighted when Govinda Dasi was successful in cultivating Tulsi in Hawaii that Srila Prabhupada praised her right in his own words in Srimad Bhagavatam. <clears throat> because Srila Prabhupada wanted his disciples and followers to be anointed with the emblem of Tulsi on their foreheads. And Tulsi beads in our hands. Tulsi beads around our necks to make us offerable to Krishna. <clears throat> At the end of her human lila, when she was cursed, Vishnu was simultaneously cursed by Tulsi to become a stone. Why? Because he had cheated her. He had apparently sullied her chastity. And she said, even after all that, you don't say anything? You just stand there like a stone. And your heart must be like stone. So you might as well become a stone. <clears throat> so with the conclusion of Tulsi Devi's human-like pastimes on earth, she simultaneously became a Tulsi tree and another form, we sometimes don't acknowledge the river Gandaki. Because when she cursed Vishnu to become a stone, 
He said, and you will be the river in which those stones appear. <clears throat> When Lord Garunga, <clears throat> in the course of his South Indian tour, came to Sri Ranga, where three brothers, Ben Kut, Tiramala Bhatta, and Prabodhananda Saraswati, were so moved by his depth of love that they invited him to spend the four months of Chantri Masa in their home, which he accepted. At that time, Gopal, later glorified as Gopal Bhatta Goswami, was a young boy, five, seven years old, who by massaging the Lord's lotus feet and hearing Lord Gauranga's loving exchanges with his father and uncles became very attached to him. So much so that he began, began lamenting bitterly that why was I born so late and so far from Navadweep Dham to be bereft of the sight of Lord Garanga in his pre-sanyas days with his long wavy hair cascading down the sides of his moonlight face <clears throat> and his doting so gracefully tucked in three different places flaring out while he danced. And I only, I can only see him in his painful appearance as a sannyasi. Though he's a supreme lord, he's undergoing this difficult path of renunciation. And while he was lamenting, little Gopal was lulled into a state of yoga nidra. And the divine landscape of Navadvip Dham unfolded before his inner vision. He saw it as a golden lotus floating on the various tributaries of Ganges, filled with Tulsi gardens. And he saw the childhood form of Nimai of Nadia with his beautiful hair tied into a top knot like a crown and tied with a string of jasmine flowers leading Sankirtan down the bank of the Ganges. And in his vision, Lord Nityananda and Advaita picked him up and were about to say something to him when he awoke. <clears throat> In that dream he also saw this golden form of Nimai of Nadia transmuted into a sapphire complexion coward boy who was captivating the hearts of everyone in creation by the mellifluous ragas of his divine fruit. <clears throat> Gopal Bhatta, young boy at the time, jolted out of his yoga nidra state, filled with irresistible longing, ran to the room where Lord Gauranga was staying in their house at the time, and begged him, when Chandra Masi ends and you have to leave, please take me with you and infuse me with love of God. 
And Lord Chaitanya told him, no, you have to stay here and serve your parents who are pure devotees. When they go back to Godhead, you go to Vrindavan, where you will find my crushed jewels in the form of Shishirupa and Sanatana Goswamis. <clears throat> he followed that instruction. And when his elderly parents finally departed for the spiritual sky, even though Lord Shaitani was at the time performing his Leela in Jagannath Puri, which is much closer to Sri Rangam than Vrindavan, he adhered to the Lord's instruction, preferring Vani Seva over the Lord's Bhakti. <clears throat> he went to Vrindavan <clears throat> with his like, accepted as a younger brother to the six Goswamis and engaged by Srila Rupa Goswami in serving Radha Govinda with Vrinda Devi on the side also. And while serving Radha Govinda, Gopal Bhatta, now Goswami, was thinking, I wish I had a deity of my own. At that time, Lord Chaitanya appeared to him again in a dream and instructed him, go on pilgrimage to Muktinath, which is a town in Nepal at the foot of the Annapurna mountain where the Shalagram Shilas appear. Go to Muktinath. He followed that instruction. Arriving in that village, Gopal Bhatta Goswami First, taking bath in the Gandaki River, filled his kamandula with water, and when he was about to pour it over his head, he saw there was a Shabadam Shiva in his water bath. He respectfully placed the Shabadam back in the river, and every time he again filled his water bath, the same Shabadam Shiva with more and more and more, till a total of 12 filled his water pot. And he considered, maybe the Lord wants me to have Shalagram Shiva to worship. <clears throat> so he brought the Shalagram Shivas back to Vrindavan, where he would swing them, just like we do, Devi's of Radha and Krishna and Julianatra. He would swing the Shalagram Shilas while singing to them. And then one wealthy merchant who was so inspired by the standard of worship of the six Goswamis, he gave each of them gifts for their deities. Nice dhotis, chanters, and turbans flutes and sandals and necklaces and ankle bells and he gave them also to Gopal but to Goswami who told the merchant I am a Shalagam Shila his name is Damodar but you can't wear a dhoti and turban and play a flute so he was thinking he should give the gift back to the merchant the merchant Swami is worshiping Shalagam Shivas. And again, he was transcendentally lamenting. I really wish I had a deity of three, threefold bending form so I could dress him with this dhoti, this chatter, this turban, this, put this flute in his hands and ankle bells on his feet and necklaces around his neck. But all I have is this Dhammadar Shiva. who's actually also in the form of Lord Garanga in his ecstasy when all his rims were drawn inside his body like a tortoise. 
So he was transcendentally lamenting until the day of Nasringa Chaturthis, when he was hearing everywhere in Vrindavan devotees glorifying Lord Nishingadev, who for the pleasure of his devotee Prahlad appeared in a form, half man, half lion, from a stone pillar. And Gopal Bhatta Goswami was thinking, if Lord Nishingadev could appear from a stone pillar, could Krishna appear from my Shalakam Shila? Everywhere he went, he kept hearing how Lord Nishingadeva appeared from a stone pillar until he didn't want to hear it anymore. But wherever he went, he kept hearing the form of the Lord appeared from a stone pillar. Finally, he prayed to his Shalagam Shilas while putting them to rest, My Lord, please don't be hard hearted and deprive me of this opportunity of serving. Your threefold bending form, wearing dhoti and chatter and turban and playing on your flute. He put the deities to rest, and after bathing in the river in the morning, came back and removed the cover, and the Damodar Shila had fulfilled his deepest yearning by appearing in the form of Radharaman. A very beautiful threefold bending form of Krishna. Integrated all the features of the lotus feet of Badana Mohan representing Sambandha, the chest of Govinda, meaning Abhideya, and the smiling face of Gopinath, revealing Prayujana, life sultan. <clears throat> when the other Goswamis came and marveled at the beauty and the intricate detail of this deity who has even little tiny teeth and eyebrows, self-manifesting form of Krishna at Nidiva. Therefore, they named him Radharama, the form of Krishna who gives pleasure to Srimati Radharani. And that name, Radharama, is the essence of that deity whose name forms the stanza of the Hare Krishna mantra. Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram. <clears throat> and even when the waves of iconoclastic moguls and foreign invaders clash with local with <clears throat> local armies, Brother Raman never left Vrindavan, earning him the epithet Heartbreak. That was also the case of Vrindadevi. When the Jayapur kings were so fearful for the plight of the deities and devotees in Braj that they sent an ox cart under the cover of darkness, following the Parikrama Mara, stopping at all the temples, not for Darshan, but to take the deities on board. First, delivering them to the safety and shelter of Radha's leg, where the first seven replica temples were built. And the deities and devotees lived peacefully for some time until gradually the threat also reached there, at which time they moved the deities to Kamyaba. Gradually, the threat reached there, and the caravan came back to take the deities to Jaipur. They put all the deities on board the various ox carts. But when the caravan tried to, when the caravan began to move, the one ox cart was from Mobile, was Vrindas. A 
rock star. It wouldn't move. The oxen restrained it. They couldn't move a single deity on the ox cart. They brought powerful horses, mighty wrestlers, huge elephants, hooked them all to the ox cart, and it would not budge. And when the devotees prayed to Vrindadev, <clears throat> why are you performing this custom? Her response is most significant. Krishna can come and go as he wills, the Radha will surely go with him. But I can't go. Because what would devotees think if they came to Vrindavan and heard that Vrindadevi had left? So she said, I'm sorry. She's there, she's there today in Kamivan, the forest where her ultimate, deepest yearning was fulfilled in being united with Krishna in holy matrimony by the arrangement of Sri Mati Rajaraja herself. So, <clears throat> in Braj, and we find it also in Ubradava. The highest blessings are sometimes encrypted in curses, or what you would accept as a curse, or think to be a curse, or interpret as a curse. Srimati <clears throat> Radharani is cursed by the day. To descend to earth is a blessing because in so doing, she expanded to grace all of Vaikuntha with her divine presence. She further descended on earth to nourish and deepen our taste for Brajras, which is all crystallized in the touchstone of the Holy Man. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So it says on the calendar that today is Tulsi's marriage with Shalom. Some people are saying that's not the ability of the <coughs> It's definitely a bridge of festival. So what's our identity? Chandavadevi. <clears throat> so effortless, not effortless, painstakingly throughout her life, committed to integrating the customs of Raj with those of the audience. So whether or not we're going to celebrate Tulsi's marriage with Shalagram Shiva, we must appreciate that this is her birthday. This is the day when the presiding deity of Vrindavan descended and expanded across the earth to Support through the Prophet's mission of spreading the holy name to every town and village. And make our earthly bodies, minds, and psyche offerable to Krishna. But he told us to live everywhere on our forehead. He told us mala with which we chant the holy name. And the Tulsi Kanti Mala signifying that we are the property of Krishna, trying to become dear to him by endearing our hearts to his most beloved Tulsi Maharani Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. 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 Jai.
So now we are going to have our little ones doing their play offering. So for, for that, I, uh, we need to empty this space. So 